<clears throat> right, um, so today we're going to look at a rifle from probably what I consider the uh, sort of peak period of uh, air gun production and air gun usage. Um, it was a time when I was using air guns an awful lot and uh, it's a time when most of the well-known um, really iconic air rifles um, were coming into common usage or just being released. And I'm talking about the, the uh, early 80s. Now, around about this time, you had rifles like the HW35 Export were becoming more widely available in the UK. Um, they were getting tuned up by companies like Vixen. Um, and other companies were tuning them up. I think uh, Rod, uh, Rod Lyndon, that used to write for Egg and World, was uh, slightly altering them and amending them slightly. Uh, anyway, so they had like a boom period. Um, then you had Defame with Bow Sport, another iconic air rifle, uh, probably one of the best brake barrel uh, sporting air rifles ever made. That was released. You had the HW, uh, I mean the original 45 was released, uh, the original 50. Um, you had weapons like the uh, the Vulcan, the Osprey, um, there was a whole host day state started off with their first um, very early versions of the PCP air rifle. Theoban released their brilliant rifles and uh, launched us into the uh, the gas ram. And these days gas rams are everywhere, everyone's got a gas ram. I reviewed the uh, Diana 340 Entech, which I suppose is a sort of spiritual successor to the, uh, the Theobans. Um, and then you had other companies coming out being formed. We had uh, a company called uh, Sussex Armoury that used to make the Jackal, um, which in itself was a bit of a, a sort of years ahead, really. That was, The Jackal was the first really widely available air rifle to make use of an ABS um, sort of synthetic stock. Uh, and have that sort of military, sort of tactical style in that you see everywhere these days. Everyone's got tactical air rifles. Nearly everything's got that tactical look. And it all started off really with the uh, Sussex Armoury Jackal and another one which was like a sort of carbine version of that called the AR7, I think it was. Um, and these really kicked off the uh, that sort of tactical look, really. They were years ahead of the time, really, in that respect. Um, but the actual rifles were made by, I think it was called at the time NJ Engineering, used to make all the uh, all the actions for them. Uh, and when Sussex Army went bust, um, which was a real shock because it was coming out with new rifles all the time, like the uh, like I said, they were really ahead of the game, really. Um, and the rifles were very, very powerful, very powerful, right just under the legal limit. And you've got to remember at the time, that was quite rare in uh, British air rifles especially. Um, and even in the German ones, I mean, like an export, a standard export bought off the shelf before it was tuned up or modified, probably only getting about 10 and a half foot pounds. Even a fame up by sport was probably only getting about 11. You know, it wasn't till the Vulcan sort of appeared and the original 45 that those power levels went up. Well, that, uh, the early jackals were very powerful. I mean, they resonated and shot like a bag of potatoes because of the hollow plastic stocks. Um, but they did do wood versions with the wood stock was much, much better. But those rifles were made by a company called NJ Engineering. And when Sussex Army went bust, uh, they took over and have grown into the all-conquering air arms that we know today. Um, a company that which really has done so much for the sport, you know, they sponsor HFT shoots, field target shoots, um, the sprint shoot thing, um, which they helped inaugurate, I think. I'm right, um, they do tons of stuff. They're at all the shows. Uh, really, really iconic British company they've become. Um, and it all came about because of the downfall of Sussex Army. They had a whole load of their guns in stock and decided that they were going to start selling them under their own banner. Um, so, the 80s, iconic period, loads of different guns arriving. Really good, which is unusual because it was a difficult period to sell stuff in as well. That was one of the other complaints about that period from loads of British gun makers. It was a hard time to sell anything uh, because of the recession. So you wouldn't imagine that a company would suddenly jump onto the scene and try and release an air rifle. 
uh, which is exactly what the company that made this gun we're going to look at today in a minute did. And the company was Sterling Armaments, a company famous for making the Sterling submachine gun, um, which was like a, a spiritual successor, if you like. The Sten gun looked very similar, but it had a, a perforated uh, shrouded barrel and a, a more curved um, side-fed magazine. And that rifle saw service everywhere with the British Army. Uh, I think it saw service in Korea. Uh, saw service in the Malayan jungles. I think it even saw service in the Falklands. Uh, Northern Ireland, all over the place. Everywhere the British Army were, you find a sterling submachine gun. Great, 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 reliable, well-made, tough, rugged little gun. So when they decided to make an air gun, it was no surprise that they came up with what they did. And I'll just get it out and show you. And they came up with this. And this is a Sterling HR81. Now, they released this in 1982, I think it was, very beginning of 82. Um, and Sterling made, um, I suppose they made sort of three variants of this, really. And they made this as it stands. This is an early one, this is serial number. 1030 1038 so this is quite quite an early one in the run um they made this then they fitted it out with a uh, more elaborate uh warm stock that uh, had a more contoured pistol grip a palm swell a rollover monte carlo cheek piece <clears throat> and actually ran a bit longer it ran almost to here so it ran a bit hid most of this Part of the mechanism and that they call HR uh, 81DL Deluxe um, and then later on the following year followed by uh, the feedback from uh, people who were using these guns they introduced an updated version which they call HR 83 um, like I say this is a uh, an earlier version this is the first one that came out, the HR81, the original version. They only made air rifles until 1984, uh, and then production ceased. And it wasn't long after that that the company effectively went bust um, and was sold off. Um, so it had a very, very limited um, production span. Eventually, the design was purchased by Benjamin in uh, the United States in about 1988, I think it was. And for a very limited time, they made some in America. Um, but to be honest, the finish wasn't as good as the British rifles. And really, it wasn't suitable for the American market um, because of the... Well, I'll come to that in a bit. So, let's talk through it then. So, I had a very, very limited run, and there were sort of three main versions. This one, this one fitted with a nice warm stock, and the HR83, which I'll come to in a minute. So we'll go through this one first. So it was an unusual design um, for the time. Um, and never has a rifle been released, I don't think, that drew so much polarised opinion. Some people loved it, some people hated it. Um, it really did draw a massive polarising of opinion from people. And some of that was because it was a little bit ahead of its time, really, in some ways. So what it has, it's an underlever. Standard underlever air rifle, um, but the barrel and the, uh, the the chamber, the magazine loading chamber, the breech is mounted above the barrel in one long extended tube, and the pellet is loaded through this little scalloped uh, loading breech area here. So you pop a pellet in there, and then slide the breech closed using the bolt and at the time bolt action air rifles were almost unknown the only place you'd see a bolt action air rifle was on um, the Sheridan and the Benjamin um, pump up air rifles obviously now you know we've become so used to bolt actions on pneumatic rifles um, and if you look at the actual outlay of this with the <laughs> with the uh, the cylinder the power plant if you like and the um, the 
breech and the barrel superimposed on the top. It runs the pretty much the same sort of standard layout as most PCPs, but instead of an underlever and a, and a cylinder, you now just have an air cylinder. But the actual layout is very, very similar, uh, loaded with a bolt of some description, which has become very popular and now it has been superseded by side leads. So in some ways, this was way ahead of its time. This bolt action mechanism for loading it was ahead of its time, really. Inside of here, there was a little sizing um, device um, that made sure that every pellet was the same size by sliding it, pushing it through the sizer as it went into the barrel. So it made it slightly more accurate than most, because don't forget at the time as well, early 80s, there were a lot of really rubbish pellets around. Far more um, inconsistent, badly made air rifle pellets than you see on the market today. Um, it was one of the main faults really with the air guns then. It wasn't so much the air rifles, it was the ammunition they were shooting, it was very poor. So Sterling tried to overcome this a bit by putting in a sizer and then building it integral into the rifle. The bolt is spring loaded, so when you lift it, fits in the little caps there, you lift it and it springs back of its own accord. The rifle cocks, like I say, standard underlever mechanism. So you cock the rifle, return that, open the bolt, pellet in, close the bolt, and away you go. There's no safety catch on the HR81s, though a safety catch was introduced on the HR83s. Um, the idea was if you wanted to leave it on safe, you just left the, uh, the bolt open. If you left the bolt open, um, it meant you could still discharge the gun and air had come out of it, but the pellet wouldn't because the pellet hadn't been seated um, beyond the transfer port. Obviously not ideal because that meant that your uh, piston would be slapping into the end of the cylinder without any, um, any buffering and therefore would probably wreck the, uh, the washer. These used a leather washer. Um, there was a leather washer on and the main selling point of this rifle at the time was the fact that Sterling made great play of the fact that the whole rifle was made of premium firearms grade steel. Uh, and in many ways, it was a throwback to an, a, even an earlier time of like the 50s and 60s and the Webley Mark III. When you look at the engineering standards on this thing, it's, everything isn't just metal, everything is steel. There's no castings. The only casting that's on it is the foresight assembly. There's a casting, but even that's made out of steel. Um, everything else, machine steel. There's no pressings. The underlever is one solid piece of steel. Breech block assembly, all steel. The end caps, well, you can see there, but the end caps are such a good fitting. It's totally seamless. Breech block, all steel, sights, all steel. Everything was steel on it. There was no alloy components um, and the only casting was that. So it was built like guns from the 50s and 60s really, rather than a rifle from the 80s. This gave it a considerable heft and it also made it very expensive um, because it was made out of such premium materials. Um, the wood to metal fit is superb and on the original guns the bluing and polishing of the final metal work was absolutely superlative. Even people that were handling, gunsmiths that were handling uh, top end English shotguns at the time commented on how incredibly well done the final polishing and bluing of these rifles was. Sadly this one's seen a lot of use. I um, mean it's in good nick and it's complete. There's nothing missing from it, but the blue in house, it's not corroded, there's no rust on it, but it's just showing signs of wear, handling over the years. Because you've got to remember, this rifle's nearly 40 years old. Uh, you know, you've got a 40 year old air rifle here that's been used, has been used, it's seen a lot of use. Stock's not marked at all, but the blue in has seen better days. There's no rust, but it's just worn. Uh, this actual rifle, believe it or not, was actually been on a, on a video on YouTube before. Um, Bob at uh, 
City Air Weapons in Birmingham borrowed it to uh, Tony Bellas, who was doing a video with uh, Lloyd Schrober from Blackpool Air Rifles. Um, I can't remember what the program was called, but it was like a chat thing that they did. And this actual air rifle was uh, actually shown momentarily on that uh, on that channel. I think it was when Sterling Arms were due to start uh, going back into production again. I think Tony, Tony was uh, um, a bit of a sort of front sort of stroke spokesman for that company. Uh, as it happened, it never came to fruition, but I think it was on a video, something to do with that, that this gun was on. Um, so there you go. Anyway, so stock is in really good nick. They had a fairly straightforward stock on the first ones, which is why they introduced the warm-up one. Um, it does come up to the shoulder really well, though, in all fairness. And it's a nice gun to uh, to bring in onto the aim. It comes up really well. It's got a really nicely styled stock, but it's a bit plain. And it's also got that other great uh, advance in the 80s, not pressed checkering. And what a dismal failure that was. Obviously in the 80s they were looking at ways, gun companies world over were looking at ways of cutting back on the costs. Hand cut checkering, very expensive. So they came up with the idea of actually pressing the checkering into the rifle. Uh, it wasn't just Sterling. BSA did it on the Mercury S. Air Sport S had it. Uh, the original Model 50 and the later one, the 50 Tier 1 had press checkering and all loads of other guns that had press checkering and it was rubbish it doesn't matter who did it right the way across the board it was rubbish you cannot effectively press checkering into a rifle cosmetically it gave it a bit of a lift but as regards function they were all the same press checkering was a dead end um, and obviously these days it's been replaced by the far nicer and almost as good as hand cut jackering, laser cut jackering, um, which nearly all air rifles that have got jackering on now, it's all laser cut. And it's, in all fairness, when it's done well, um, like on the Walther or on that Diana that I've got, it, it really is very good. It's nearly as good as hand cut jackering. Um, but in the 80s, it was quite common to see this press checker and it was a, it was a flop. Um, you could tell it was a flop because when they made the walnut stock version of this, they went back to hand cut checker and just uh, swallowed up the extra cost. Um, so the stock was fairly plain, like I say, and, uh, you know, it's functional, it's nice, it was well fitted. It fitted to the gun really well, the woods amount fit was superb. But it was a bit plain so when it came out as we're saying this gun got really really mixed uh, reviews um, and we're going back to a time when the magazines were a little bit more uh, blunt and honest than they are now um, to put it mildly um, and i mean they really were you know when jeffrey uh, jeff boxall i think it was and rod Lyington and so several other people were writing for egg and world um they really were quite blunt in their reviews um this particular rifle when it was reviewed by jeff boxall quite complimentary about the way it was built everyone was complimentary about the way it was built because really there was not a lot you could knock you know it's made out of military grade top quality stainless steel you know the steels in it are brilliant there's no plastics in it like that. so there's nothing to knock there but what he didn't like was the trigger because the trigger on the HR81 was a single stage trigger. Now at the time, all the German guns that they were competing against had two stage triggers. You've got the Fame Bow, the originals, um, which which obviously is Diana nowadays and before then as well. But after the war, they changed the original. But anyway, they had two stage triggers. Um, a lot of British guns still stuck to single stage triggers. BSA did. Some of the Webleys did, and when the Sterling came out, everyone thought it would be an ideal opportunity that they were going to put a two-stage trigger on it, and they didn't. The first one had a single-stage trigger. Um, <clears throat> the HR83 had a two-stage trigger, but this one had a single-stage trigger. Now, I happen to think 
that it's a very, very good single stage trigger. It's creep free, obviously, um, and it has a really crisp and predictable and fairly light for a spring air rifle uh, let off. And I really like it, but it got a lot of flack because it was single stage. But I like it. I think it's a good, a good single stage trigger. And what they did on the HR83, they replaced it with a two stage trigger. The problem being is that the trigger they replaced it with was possibly worse than the single stage trigger because at least this was creep free, predictable and very light. The trigger they replaced it with was mushy, a bit unpredictable and not very nice at all. It was two stage, but it was not a very nice trigger at all. Nowhere near as good, I don't think, as the original triggers, single stage, though they were. You get used to a single stage trigger. It's a, it's a fault, uh, well, a, a, people see it as a fault of the Edgar Leshy, um, which also has a single stage trigger. And I must admit, I own one of them rifles and I think I found nothing wrong with that trigger at all. It was great, it was predictable, it was light and it was very good. And this is the same. Single stage, yes, but predictable and light, crisp, it is. The other thing that you got slagged off for was being a tall and ungainly rifle. Because what you've got to remember is at the time most people were shooting brake barrels where the cylinder and barrel were all in line and it was a fairly narrow profile. And this has, because it's got superimposed barrels, a higher profile. But again, this is something that these days we're all used to. All PCPs have got this higher profile. And some of the bullpups have got an even higher profile because then you've got a scope rail that's stuck on up here and your scope's up here. You know, some of them you've got rifles that are sort of seven inches from the top of your scope to the bottom of the gun, seven inches deep. So when they called it ungainly, um, they would probably have died of a heart attack if they were seeing what we shoot these days. And then the other criticism that was levelled at it was that it couldn't you couldn't put a sling. They're obsessed with sling swivels in them days as well. Um, you couldn't put a sling swivel on the bottom because the barrel latch was held in the little detent um, sort of ball bearing type thing. Um, so you couldn't fit sling swivel on the front. So what they did on the HR83, they put a latch mechanism on the foresight assembly um, that locked the latch, the under lever in place, so you could fit a, uh, a sling. All well and good, the only trouble is, the latch mechanism they fitted on them was so stiff that Half the time you find yourself fighting with the bloody things to get them undone. I had an early version of the 83 for a short while that I borrowed off a friend of mine that was shooting it uh, and he broke his arm and I borrowed it for a bit and it was bloody awful. It was so stiff to try and get it undone. It was terrible. Um, and the other thing that they did on the 83 as well and something that is uh, that you see sometimes on these is the foresight assembly is fixed. It's one solid steel casting. Um, and what they did it because people were complaining that you that it would get in the way of the telescopic sight, even though it doesn't really because of the uh, the focusing issues because it's so close to the sight it's almost out of focus. But so what they did they made it so you could slide the foresight off uh, on the HR eighty ones you couldn't. And what you tend to find on some of these that you find second hand is someone's bought one, fitted a scope on it, and decided they're always going to use a scope. And what they've done is they took a hacksaw and sawed the end off sawed the uh, the foresight off that's quite a common thing you see on them um, you see them up for sale and they've got telescopic sight on and the reason is they took this foresight um, bits away off and they hacksawed through that and that's a common thing that you will come across when you're looking for a second hand HR81 that you will see that some of them have had <clears throat> the foresight sawn through um, and the other thing they did on HR83 is they fitted a safety catch inside the trigger guard. And again, I don't know, considering that the HR83 was supposed to be an improvement on the HR81, the safety catch they fitted was really stiff uh, in a pretty awkward place and very loud to operate. Uh, and the other thing with it was it was held in place with a pin, so if you took the stock off, um, it was quite common for the um, safety catch to fall apart. So really, to be honest with you, the HR83 was probably, rather than an improvement on the HR81, it was actually probably a, a retrograde step. It was, it was actually a worse rifle. The latch was stiff and horrible. 
The trigger was two stage, yes, but awful. The safety catch was stiff, noisy, and fell apart if you took the stock off. And the only the only plus point to it was was the uh, that it was fitted with a nice walnut stock with a hand cut checker on the pistol grip on on the forearm, and the stock was very 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 nice. But personally, I think they should have just stuck with the DL version of this. So this basic rifle with that walnut stock, because the HR83 was not, I don't think, an advance in any way. And as I was saying, them days in the magazines, they were bluntly honest. And uh, whilst they praised the build quality, the accuracy and the power, because this gun was bob on the uh, 12 foot pound limit, um, a lot of reviewers didn't like that single stage trigger and they were very blunt in them days you know there was no messing about there was no like like you get now where they say oh it's perhaps not the best trigger then they were you know the, the trigger was it was saying things like the trigger was rubbish or well, the trigger was a big disappointment and the little latch that they couldn't undo now whereas now they might say it was a little bit stiff then they said that it was stiff couldn't undo it and it was awful not not of a good design um, for a problem on the HR83 the difference in the reviews in them days was unbelievable. They were so blunt and honest in their reviews. You don't see a bad review of a rifle now. Then, any little fault, bang, they were on it straight away. Made you fully aware of it. Told you the truth as it was. It was a whole different world in the magazines in them days. I think now they're so reliant on um, their advertising and getting everything for free. So if, for instance, Day State's giving you or sending you a new air rifle to test, if you slag it off and say it's rubbish or something's really wrong with it, next time they release a new air rifle, you ain't going to get it. Um, so everyone's really nice about everything. And it runs to some YouTube channels as well, where they're not buying stuff, they're getting given it to test. Um, so they get it for free to test it, and they're not going to slate it off. Because if they do, next time they release a new rifle, you ain't going to get it. So there you go. HR81 and I'll show you what I mean about the way that the world's changed uh, in its entirety as well for um, air guns and especially the mags these things will push like Billy O with adverts saying about the uh, the quality of the steels and everything was the main pushing point on these but others back in the day and this is quite amusing now especially in this day and age used quite a lot of um, quite blatant sexism in uh, advertising to try and push stuff and I'll just show you one of the typical adverts from Airgun World when this rifle came out. And this will make you laugh because remember we're going back to the 80s, 82. Um, and you certainly wouldn't see that these days, but look at that for an advert. <laughs> now it's been reversed around because uh, I've got my, my camera on the front focus, but it says, if I told you you had a beautiful Diana, would you hold it against me? Now, can you imagine that, you know, a really attractive woman fondling an air rifle being used as advertising today? I think not. So it gives you an idea of the period of time that this gun was made. You know, 40 years ago, it's a long time ago. You know, probably an awful lot of people watching this channel weren't even born then. And when you look at this, you know it's actually kept everything's on it it still functions it's low powered now because they have the leather washer in these um, and obviously over time this particular one's never had the mainspring changed and it's never had the washer changed this is only doing about 10 foot pounds um, but you know it it's kept so well apart from the wearing on the bluing everything functions exactly as it did when it was new everything it's solid you know it's just a solid solid gun and that was one of the problems with it as well of course it was like the Webley Mark III they were so solid and so well made that there's still lots of them around you know Webley Mark III is the same that gun's from 1967 and there's tons of those still in because they were so well made that they just don't fall apart they just don't they lose a bit they lose their power then the, the uh, washers dry up and the mainsprings fade away but they just don't um, they don't ever die and this is the same it's so well made that they just they just don't break nothing goes wrong with them because everything's really well made you know the, the casted rifles rifles with aluminium castings on plastic plastic um, 
breaks down over time. Um, aluminium alloys fracture and crack over time. Solid machine gun steel just doesn't. Um, now one of the unusual things with this, it didn't have much of an export market because 12 foot pounds really, or just over possibly, was about the most it could manage because it had a rather elaborate transfer port um, that ran from the cylinder up to where the pellet is. It was a very sort of multi-directional transfer port which didn't aid the power output, which was why it never became very popular in America, even when Benjamin made it. Um, so really, you could say that it was a, a UK gun, pretty much designed for the UK market. Um, it was made to shoot at 12 foot bows, it was made to shoot accurate, it was made to last a long time in the tradition of British gun making. And it's a bit ugly, yes it is. This bit here makes it a bit ugly and the stock's a bit boring. But I love this gun. I think it's it's a bit it's a bit of an icon. It's an underplayed iconic rifle. Um, from a great British company with a great history that sadly no longer exists. You know. Um, I mean if you look at what happened to Webley, Webley, like my Mark III, is probably one of my most that's one of my favourite rifles, it really is. And it donkey's years it's a great rifle um, from an iconic company that now really is just a name stuck on um, guns made in Turkey really not that there's anything wrong with them they still make nice rifles but they're not they're not proper Webleys they're uh, Turkish rifles simple as that um, you know and fair dues to uh, companies like BSA Still made here in Britain, or all, all right, they're owned by uh, I think they're part of the Gamo uh, concern now, but they still make the rifles here. In fact, they make Gamos here, which is a proper turnaround because you've got um, a foreign buyer's rifles being made in Britain in the BSA factory, uh, and then you've got Air Arms, which rose up from Sussex Armoury um, and has now become one of the most dominant players in the field, making beautiful rifles. And then you've got Day State, which kicked off in the 80s with their first version of Huntsman. Look at them. Doing well, selling all over the place. And they've gone the other way. Their guns now mainly are designed for the American market, really. They've gone designing stuff that's capable of massively high powers with all sorts of um, adjustment capabilities, but all geared really towards the American market. Um, and fair dues to them. You know, they're doing well. So there you go. So Sterling HR81. And a little bit of a history lesson. Sorry about that, but there you go. Look at that. It is, even now, I still think that's a lovely looking gun. Really is. Thanks for watching.